the sermon today really requires us to read a long passage, John 11, 1 to 44, which would take too long. So I just selected a f- as few verses I can without taking too much time. But I would encourage you to go home and read the whole passage. A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. Jesus didn't go. Instead, he waited for two more days before he left. It turns out, we find out later in the story, Lazarus died shortly after the sisters sent the messengers. But Jesus waits for two more days, so by the time he arrives, Lazarus has been dead for four days. Then after waiting for two more days, Jesus said, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, by which he meant he had died, but now I will go and wake him up. When Jesus arrives at Martha's house, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. The Jewish people at this time believed in the resurrection. So she's saying, of course, you know. At the end, everybody's going to rise and he will, be, he will rise at that time. But Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. When Jesus saw Mary weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him, and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him? He asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. That's the Jewish tomb. You know, it's not like us digging the ground, but they find an empty tomb, put put the body inside, and then you know, close it with a rock. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he has been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Jesus responded, Didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? Amen. If you believe, you will see God's glory. So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here, so that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. Came out, his hands and feet bound in grave cloths, his face wrapped in head cloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him. And let him go. Amen. This past Wednesday was Ash Wednesday. That marks the beginning of Lent. We're in the Lent season now. If you're Catholic, you might have gone to the church and uh, had the priest put, uh, put ashes on your forehead in the symbol of the cross. Do you know what Ash Wednesday is for and why, you know, they put ashes on their forehead? Ash Wednesday is to remind us of our mortality. The Bible says ashes to ashes, meaning we came from the dirt and we are going to return to the dirt. So it is to remind ourselves that we're going to die. To remember that we will die sooner or later. That is precisely the thing that we try not to think about. Psychologists say that our brain is composed in such a way 
until the very moment we face our death, we just cannot think about our own death in a realistic manner. You know, we see other people die. I said, really not my story. It is something that we just, something about our psychology, refuse to think about. British author Julian Barnes compared the way we treat our own death to the way we treat our retirement pension. I don't know if retirement pension still exists, but you know, some time ago, if you work for a company, they will, you, know, you can put money into your retirement fund. <clears throat> he said, in our, you know, we begin to work in our 20s typically. In our 20s and 30s, we could care less about our retirement pension. Retirement? What is that? I mean, like, I'm young. Why should I think about retirement? It's like as far away as eternity. What's that? We don't think about it. By the time we arrive at our 40s, the thought of retirement begins to creep into our minds and this thought yeah, I should do something about my retirement. But most of us still feel pretty strong and healthy. It's like, well, not really. I don't really have to think about our retirement. And then 50s come, and the urgency begins to come. It's like, it's a serious thing. And it's like 10 years away, and I really have to do something about my retirement. And then after 50s, 60s rush in so fast, before you know it, it is that time. And we find ourselves totally unprepared. Average Americans have less than a few thousand dollars saved up for their retirement. Utterly unprepared. And Julian Barnes said, we treat death like that. We don't think about it. We don't feel the need to think about it. But as we are pushing away the thought of death, death marches on silently, but it keeps on marching. It comes nearer and nearer, and before we know it, it is standing at the door and knocking. And we are not prepared. Ash Wednesday says, Remember that there is coming to you as well. It for sure is coming to all of us. There are like, biblically speaking, only like two people who never faced death. Enoch and Elijah. Not very high percentage. It's coming to you. Death sometimes comes as a surprise. Did you notice that death does not follow the birth order? You came first, you die first. Just this week, ironically, as I'm preparing for this sermon, my phone rang. An old member back from the East Coast called me to let me know that his brother-in-law, who was also my student when he was in college, a guy that I was very fond of, had just died from a heart attack. He was 55 years old, younger than I am. It comes without warning sometimes, and the question is, are you ready? Are you prepared? The primary feeling related to death is fear, of course. Who does not fear their own death? Unless, that is, you really have a faith in Jesus Christ. I remember listening to this preacher, you know, this Korean preacher. And all Koreans have, men have to join the army, right? And uh, when he was young, uh, you know, he was sent to Vietnam this a long time ago. And very scary. A lot of people are dying. And they had to go into this cave because they thought Viet Congs were inside there. And like high-risk situation. And there's his platoon, and they're all like, you know, <laughs> you have to go into this cave. Everybody's scared. And uh, his platoon mates were pushing him. You go first. You go first. 
I said, I said why me, man? Why me? He said, you're a Christian. <laughs> Even if you die, you're going to be okay. You go. <laughs> Nobody wants to die. But that's true. If you're really Christian, if we really have faith, we would not fear death. But otherwise, fear is a primary emotion. There are two other emotions that death provokes, evokes. One is sorrow. There is no sorrow like the sorrow over the death of someone we love. When I was a child, we had a dog. This is back in Korea. And this dog gave birth to puppies in the middle of an unusually cold winter. And we were careless and did not realize that we should have put extra insulation into the dog house. You know, dogs stayed in the, in, outside in Korea back then. And all six puppies perished. All of them died from the cold. And I remember the sorrows of the mother dog. She whimpered for days. And she would not let go of those corpses. If so profound is the sorrow of an animal, how much more profound the sorrows of human beings when we lose somebody that we love? Another emotion is anger. Some of you know the famous poem by Dylan Thomas that he wrote after his beloved father died. Do not go gentle into that good night. And he ends that stanza, and actually every stanza, rage, rage against the dying of the light. Rage. Why rage? We rage at death because of our powerlessness. You know, facing death is like a powerless peasant fighting against a powerful evil lord. You cannot defeat that guy. You just cannot win. The only thing you can do is rage. Now, we see these two emotions in today's passage. We see Jesus' anger. Jesus is angry at death. Twice in verses 33 and 38, it says, Jesus was moved with deep anger. You know, another translation says, indignation. When he saw this death, he was so angry, deeply moved at death. Why does death anger God? Because that's not how God meant the creation to be. Yeah? God did not create you to die. God did not create you to decay. God created us to prosper, not to perish. The Bible says, I know the plans that I have for you, for you to prosper. You know, to thrive and become beautiful, then to decay. That's how God meant every one of us to be, to prosper, to become fully what God created us to be, to be beautiful, to be strong. You know, death to God is something like this, I think. Imagine you're a builder. You build this beautiful house. You really put a lot of thought and energy to it. You build this beautiful thing. Imagine your house, perhaps. And someone comes and trashes the house. It's your house. And someone just came uninvited, trashes it. How angry you would be. That is the anger of God. When he sees a life that is perishing. Because that's not how God meant the creation to be. Another emotion is we see the sorrow of Jesus. Jesus wept. 
People ask, why did Jesus weep when he, he knew <clears throat> he was going to raise Lazarus in a short while? Why did he weep? Well, his sorrow was not over Lazarus per se, <clears throat> but his sorrow was over the death of all of us, humanity. Because that is not how God created us to die. He did not create us to die. So when he sees people die, every one of us, he weeps. Because that's not how he created you and me to be. He does not want you to fail and get lost and decay. Your life just this, this, this disintegrating before our eyes. We see those lives. And God is sorrowful at every, every one of those lives. Because that's not how God wants people to be. He, want pe he wants people to prosper and do well and thrive as his children. So Jesus identifies with our sorrow and anger. But that's where our similarities end. We are powerless before death. There's nothing we can do except weep or raise our fist in anger. But Jesus is powerful. He's mighty. He's a Messiah, which means he's a deliverer. And Jesus came to defeat and destroy death for his beloved. Amen. He came to defeat death, to destroy death for his beloved. And he demonstrated that power by raising Lazarus from the dead. Now, as we saw, when Martha missed Jesus, Jesus tells Martha, your brother will rise again. And Martha says, of course, Lord, yes, he's going to rise with everyone at the last day. And Jesus corrects her. No, Martha, that's not what I mean. He means, I'm going to raise him right now. And then this is what he says. I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus means... The one that is raising the dead, whether now or at the end of time, is not some cosmic impersonal force that when the time, you know, is time now, the force comes in and raises people from the dead. It is not. It is Christ who will raise the dead. It is a person. It is not some formula. It is not some force, but it is a person that will raise the dead. Christ will call, and they will rise. It is a person. And Jesus is saying, it is me. I am the resurrection. I am the life. You know, in the scientific community, how life began is still a mystery that they cannot figure out. You know, if you believe in evolution. Okay, that's another story, but... You know, even if you believe in evolution, how did this whole thing begin? How does this inorganic material suddenly become organic? How did life begin? And they cannot figure out. And you know, one of, one of, the, one of the most popular theory, theories is a life dropped from another planet. And they used to say life came from Mars. That was a very popular theory for a long time. Life came from Mars, which is, just begs the question, how did it begin in Mars? doesn't solve anything. Well, here is the answer to that question. It came from God. Because God is the source of life. And the Bible says life was in Christ. It is Christ, God himself, who is a person 
who initiated life on earth. And because Jesus is alive, he can raise the dead anytime he wants. He is a resurrection and he's alive. And while Jesus was walking on the on earth, he raised a few people from the dead to demonstrate his power. And in fact, I hope you will believe Christians are raising people from the dead even today. I've never seen it. I've seen cancer healed, all kinds, all kinds of things. I have not yet seen dead rise, but it is actually not that uncommon. People are being raised from the dead in Jesus' name because Jesus is life. He can raise people from the dead anytime he desires. That is what Jesus is saying. So he says, those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. <clears throat> and Jesus demonstrated their power by raising Lazarus from the dead. In fact, this episode that we just read, chapter 11 is at the actually very center of the whole Gospel of John. John is a very, very profound book, simple book, but very, very profound. It has 21 chapters. What is the middle of 21? If you know math, 11. Okay. 11 is right at the smack in the middle. This raising Lazarus from the dead is intentionally placed right at the center of the Gospel of John. All the things are just building up. Who is this man? Who is this man? Who is this man? And the climax is, I am the resurrection. I am the life. And from this point, story shifts very quickly. It is this incident of raising Lazarus, Lazarus from the dead that finally tips this religious leaders of Israel over, until then they were like, what do we do with this guy? What do we do with this, this tr troublesome figure? You know, people believe he's a prophet, but, you know, he's so troublesome for us. He's breaking the Sabbath and all these things. He's not under us, you know. What do we do with this? And they were like trying to figure out, you know, what, how do we do, deal with this Jesus? And it is this episode, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. It says, hey, there's nothing else. Okay, we got to kill the guy. Okay, He's completely out of our hands. And it is this episode, if you read the Bible, you find out, that directly leads to the death of Jesus. This is real irony, isn't it? Jesus raised the dead, and it is raising the dead that causes his death. And Jesus did this knowing fully what will come after he raised Lazarus from the dead. You know? That's why at the beginning of John, when he performed the first miracle of turning water into wine, he was telling his mom, Mom, it's not my time yet. <laughs> it's not time yet. Now is the time. He knows what is coming. So, this story of raising Lazarus from the dead has much deeper current of the story. It's more than just raising a dead man, which Jesus did a few other times in other Gospels. But it has a very deep current, and this is how the story goes. In order for death to be truly defeated, you know Lazarus rose from the dead, right? What happened later on, let's say in 50 years? He died. <laughs> he died. It's not like he went to heaven. No, he, he died. What about the other, like, I think three other people that Jesus raised from the dead? The girl and, you know, the young man and I forget, okay, maybe two other people. What happened to these people? They died. So death was not truly defeated. In order for death to be truly defeated, sin has to be destroyed. Because sin is a mother of death. Death came because of sin. When God created Adam and Eve, he said, don't eat from that tree 
Because if you eat it, what? You will die. Now, they didn't die immediately, but they died. It's sin that ushered in death. So for death to be defeated, sin has to be overcome. James says, 115, when sinful desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and that sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. It's like if you're a Lord of the Rings fan. To defeat Sauron, you have to destroy the ring. As long as that ring exists, Sauron cannot be defeated. In order to defeat death, sin has to be destroyed. And that's why when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he knew it would lead directly to his crucifixion. Because he came to earth to take our sin upon himself. And the Bible says to nail sin on the cross, to crucify sin, to defeat sin by paying for it, our penalty, but also destroying the power of sin. Christianity is many things. It's about healing people's lives. It's about giving hope. People come to Jesus with all kinds of problems. My son is sick. My marriage is in trouble. I lost my job. All kinds of stuff. And Jesus meets all these needs. But ultimately, Christian faith is not about these things. It's about the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. It's about resurrection. It is about sin, defeating sin, and resurrection. How happy Jesus will be when he returns. And maybe we're all dead by now, by then we're in the grave. And Jesus says, rise. And we come out. How happy Jesus will be when we greet him to live with him for eternity. About a year, year ago, I was talking to an old man. I've known this man for quite some time. And I heard that um, there was some incident and uh, he was in the hospital and he was very old by now, so I did not know if he would recover from this last latest episode. So I went to visit him at the hospital. And after talking about his health and the prospect of recovery, I began to talk about death and faith in Jesus Christ. Now that subject has always been very difficult with him, you know. But I thought, you know, this may be my last chance because I was really not sure if he was going to come out of this latest episode. <clears throat> so although he was uncomfortable, I said, this is the last time I, is maybe the last time I see the guy. So I just pressed in. I just, <laughs> just press in, right? So we had a very uncomfortable conversation for a few minutes. <laughs> it's very uncomfortable. After a few minutes of this very difficult conversation, he said to me, Danny, I think you need to change the subject. Very nice way of saying, I don't want to hear anything about it anymore. And uh, I mean, you know, if he was my best friend, I would just smack him and say, you listen to me, buddy, okay? You're going to die. You may die. I will say, but, you know, I don't have that kind of relationship. So, you know, I just have to stop. Even at that old age, he didn't want to face his death. 
He was living in denial. We must not live in denial. Yeah? Death is coming to us all. Either we die in sin and face eternal damnation, or we receive the free gift of forgiveness of sins through faith in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus paid for our sins on the cross because he loves us. He offers it free of charge. All we have to do is receive and surrender our lives to Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit begins to come to live in us, keep giving us a brand new life. And God begins to live through us, entirely new, new life. I want to ask you, are you ready? Are you sure of your salvation? If you die today, you know, if you're in the war, when your buddies go, you go first, you go first. I mean, are you, will you be able to say, yeah, I can go first. I'm all right. Let's pray together. Just in case there may be somebody who is not sure about your state of soul, if you're not sure, let's confess our sins and receive Christ into our lives. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ, that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, to die on the cross to pay for our sins so that our sins would be forgiven and our relationship with God would be restored. We would have eternal life and become children of God. All we have to do is admit that we have sinned and ask Christ into our lives. Put our faith in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Let's do that right now. Pray something like, Lord, I confess that I sinned against you. I confess my sins and ask Christ to come Forgive my sins and become my Lord. Just pray that prayer. Then the Bible promises that you will become a child of God. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We pray there will be no one among us who does not receive the gift of salvation from you. We would all have the assurance of salvation, the hope of resurrection, that we can face death, yes, with temporary sorrows, but not with fear. With great hope of resurrection, that eternity with you, we pray that everyone will receive that, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray.